I'm Jen and I make useful English Lit study videos on Shakespeare, poetry, fiction, literary devices and more. So in today's video we are looking at one of the most widely studied American novels of all time and that is F. Scott Fitzgerald's The Great Gatsby. So the novel is famous for being a sober examination of the American dream, specifically for revealing the dark underbelly of the rags to riches aspiration which had captured the imagination of many in 1920s America and of course continues to capture people's imagination today. The legendary protagonist Jay Gatsby has been the subject of much critical scrutiny and cultural fascination, largely because he embodies timeless desires that are fundamentally human, like the pursuit of love, the drive for economic success, and the hunger for social prestige. Most importantly, Gatsby exposes a key paradox of human behaviour, namely that we often pine up to things that we can't have, often precisely because we cannot have them. So this is central to Gatsby's tragedy, and in the rest of this video we're going to home in on two key reasons why Gatsby is such a tragic figure. So if you're looking for a detailed, top-grade character analysis of this elusive and fascinating character, then make sure you keep watching for all the amazing content ahead. So as always, let's start with a bit of context to frame our discussion. So to understand the historical background of The Great Gatsby, I recommend reading Fitzgerald's 1931 essay, Echoes of the Jazz Age, in which he reflects on the 1920s as being an age of miracles, an age of art, an age of excess, and an age of satire. Published in 1925, The Great Gatsby encapsulates this flamboyant and hedonistic zeitgeist of the so-called flapper era, when upholding morality took a backseat to pursuing pleasure. It's important to remember that the 1920s followed right on the heels of what was then the greatest tragic event in human history, World War I, from 1914 to 1918. Despite America's relative isolationism, the sheer scale of death and suffering nonetheless exposed for the nation the fragility of human existence and also alerted Americans to its then status as the world's supreme power, also because it had emerged largely unscathed from World War I. Now adding to this the tremendous wealth accrued from America's industrial revolution in the 19th century, what Fitzgerald called the nervous energy stored up and unexpended in the war became fertile soil for the sprouting of a sort of devil may care, carpe diem, live today, die tomorrow approach to living. Because the thinking went, if human life turned out to be so worthless and there was plenty of money sloshing about anyway, then why not just live life to its fullest today and enjoy whatever you could in the moment? To heck with morals and values. It was about gaining a foothold in the glitz and glam of the most fashionable parties, indulging in sex, alcohol, and whatever granted pleasure in the instant. Of course, this decade-long party would all come tumbling down in 1929 with the onset of the Great Depression, as an era of unrestrained boom gave way to its inevitable bust and fall. While popular culture has turned Gatsby into a shorthand for hedonistic excess, if we've read the book we'll know that Jay Gatsby himself doesn't actually partake in much of the hedonistic activities. He merely facilitates them, after which he stands aside to observe. And while it's implied that Gatsby had made his fortune through shady bootlegging and under-the-table deals, Fitzgerald never paints his protagonist as a morally repellent character. Throughout the novel, Gatsby is almost always very polite and decorous, and at worst, a bit gauche and naive but always harmless. So this is important because Gatsby's likability sets the groundwork for pathos so that readers like ourselves are ready to empathise with an otherwise deeply flawed character and understand that Gatsby isn't so much a reflection of the 20s social decay as he is the incarnation of many a victim who had embraced this social decay in pursuit of misguided dreams. So the first reason why Gatsby is tragic is that he actually doesn't know what the heck he wants. A cursory reading may point to Daisy as the target of his desire, but that's not actually quite right. In fact, we could go so far as to argue that Gatsby never really loved Daisy the person, 
but rather Daisy the identity and idea, as she represents what he could never achieve, i.e. the blue-blooded stamp of old money. This is suggested at the start of chapter 8, when the narrator Nick Carraway recalls Gatsby's anecdote about first meeting Daisy in his youth. Gatsby found Daisy excitingly desirable. He went to her house, at first with other officers from Camp Taylor, then alone. It amazed him. He had never been in such a beautiful house before. But what gave it an air of breathless intensity was that Daisy lived there. It was as casual a thing to her as his tent out at camp was to him. There was a ripe mystery about it, a hint of bedrooms upstairs more beautiful and cool than other bedrooms, of gay and radiant activities taking place through its corridors, and of romances that were not musty and laid away already in lavender, but fresh and breathing and redolent of this year's shining motor cars and of dancers whose flowers were scarcely withered. Now notice the sheer materiality in this passage's description. The emphasis is placed not really on the woman, but on the tokens and associations of wealth, beginning with the imagery of such a beautiful house, then zooming in on the bedroom upstairs, other bedrooms, corridors, motor cars, and dancers. It's also ironic that Fitzgerald writes what gave it an air of breathless intensity, instead of what gave her an air of breathless intensity, which would then have positioned the woman and not the house as Gatsby's focus. The notion that Gatsby is more enamoured with Daisy's house than he is with Daisy is also suggested by the sentence, there was a ripe mystery about it. We see then that the house, and by extension, the inherited land and wealth that comes with it, is what Gatsby fundamentally desires. And as such, Daisy's attraction is filtered through her association with the house. So she is attractive because the house was a casual thing to her. What's more, Fitzgerald goes on to write, it excited him too that many men had already loved Daisy. It increased her value in his eyes. He felt their presence all about the house, pervading the air with the shades and echoes of still vibrant emotions. So like the house, the many men who had already loved Daisy are symbols of the upper class society that Gatsby so desperately aspires to be part of. And they, not Daisy's personhood, are essentially what determines Daisy's value which is itself a word that carries monetary rather than emotional connotations. The funny thing is, had Gatsby come to terms with this, he wouldn't be so miserable. But the root of his tragedy is the delusion that he wants the woman per se, when really what he wants is the social validation that the woman could bring him. And so he invests all his hard-earned resources into impressing Daisy, without realising that everything he does, including purchasing this glamorous mansion, throwing lavish free-for-all parties, buying silk shirts he never wears, etc., all of these things stand in opposition to what Daisy represents, i.e. inherited wealth, which shows itself only to an elite cachet because it doesn't require or want the involvement of other social ineligibles, like Gatsby. This is why, for all the oohs and ahs that Daisy gushes over Gatsby's display of wealth, she is never truly affected or moved by any of it. An interesting moment to examine this comes in Chapter 5, when Gatsby starts flinging his expensive shirts in front of Daisy and Nick. He took out a pile of shirts and began throwing them, one by one before us, shirts of sheer linen and thick silk and fine flannel, which lost their folds as they fell and covered the table in many-coloured disarray. While we admired, he brought more and the soft, rich heap mounted higher. Shirts with stripes and scrolls and plaids and coral and apple green and lavender and faint orange with monograms of Indian blue. Suddenly, with a strange sound, Daisy bent her head into shirts and, and began to cry stormily. They're such beautiful shirts, she sobbed, her voice muffled in thick folds. It makes me sad because I've never seen such, such beautiful shirts before. It's a tragic comic moment, from Gatsby's tasteless flaunting of his new money to Daisy's pathetic and anodyne reaction. To her, the beautiful shirts are just that, beautiful shirts, not the poetic expression of Gatsby's burning devotion, nor even a marker of his financial success. The blinding kaleidoscope of shirt colours here mirrors Gatsby's internal confusion, which feeds on the distracting disarray of his material extravagance. Yet, 
None of it manages to convert Daisy from being Mrs. Buchanan to Mrs. Gatsby, as we will find out throughout the book. So how are we to interpret Daisy's tears at this moment? Remember, she's not as dumb and ditzy as she acts, which we know early on from her sharp awareness of Tom's affairs and mistresses. So in this scene, perhaps we can argue that she's crying because deep down she sees through Gatsby's desperation and knows that none of this will get her to do what he wants, i.e. to leave Tom and the familiar dominion of old money for Gatsby and the crude, albeit exciting, dazzling world of the novel Riche. By the way guys, if you find this video helpful so far, I'd really appreciate it if you could hit the thumbs up button below and also subscribe to my channel so that I can keep making these English Lit Study videos for you down the line. Now just as Gatsby embodies this new money America, he's also a worshipper at the altar of new love, i.e. romanticism, because he's the type of person who believes that people marry for love rather than for necessity. On the other hand, Tom and Daisy represent old money America just as much as they subscribe to the doctrine of old love because they're people who marry for necessity and not for love. Now, part of what makes Gatsby tragic then is his inability to understand this. And ironically, he can't understand it because he doesn't have enough wealth to see that for the wealthy, money, not emotions, is what often underpins marriage. To the old money crew, matrimony isn't some apotheosis of romance, but the drawbridge to resources. And this is why for Daisy, love and marriage are separate concepts. It's entirely reasonable to her that she loves Gatsby and yet wants to remain married to Tom, whereas for Gatsby, this is unfathomable. It's also why on the day of her wedding to Tom, Daisy bawls her eyes out in drunken misery over Gatsby's letter but is finally able to pull herself together in time to walk down the aisle. As Jordan Baker recounts on the day of Daisy's wedding, I was a bridesmaid. I came into her room half an hour before the bridal dinner and found her lying on her bed as lovely as the June night in her flowered dress and as drunk as a monkey. She groped around in a waste basket she had with her head on the bed and pulled out the string of pearls from Tom. Take him downstairs and give him back to whoever they belong to. Tell him all Daisy's changed her mind. Say Daisy's changed her mind. She began to cry. She cried and cried. And yet despite the momentary hysterics and regret, Daisy didn't say another word after we gave her spirits and ammonium and put ice on her forehead and hooked her back into her dress. And half an hour later, when we walked out of the room, the pearls were back around her neck and the incident was over. Next day at five o'clock, she married Tom Buchanan without so much as a shiver and started off a three months trip to the South Seas. So the matter of fact tone and the use of polysynetin and, and, and here reflect Daisy's practical, stoical acceptance of what must be done. Regardless of what she feels, she must marry Tom because that's just what's socially expected. And it's simply another step in a sequence of actions someone like her must carry out. Notice that Daisy is cast in a passive role at this moment, as she is given spirits and hooked back into her dress, with the pearls being placed promptly back around her neck. So in her world then, marriage isn't something the woman has agency over, and is a ritual that she must undergo and condition herself to accept. Gatsby, however, cannot understand this, which is later suggested in chapter 7, when Tom and Gatsby fight over Daisy's affections at the Plaza Hotel in New York. Gatsby walked over and stood beside Daisy. Daisy, just tell him the truth, that you never loved him and it's all wiped out forever. She looked at him blindly. Why? How could I love him? Possibly. You never loved him. She hesitated. I, I never loved him, she said with perceptible reluctance. Not at Capulani? demanded Tom suddenly. No. From the ballroom underneath, muffled and suffocating chords were drifting up on hot waves of air. Not that day I carried you down from the punch bowl to keep your shoes dry. There was a husky tenderness in Tom's tone. Don't. Her voice was cold, but the rancor was gone from it. She looked at Gatsby. There, Jay, she said, but her hand as she tried to light a cigarette was trembling. 
Suddenly, she threw the cigarette and the burning match on the carpet. Oh, you want too much, she cried to Gatsby. I love you now. Isn't that enough? I can't help what's past. She began to sob helplessly. I did love him once, but I loved you too. Gatsby's eyes opened and closed. You loved me too? He repeated. This is the novel's climax and also Gatsby's moment of reckoning. He's left dumbfounded by Daisy's use of the adverb too in I loved you too. While Daisy is equally frustrated by Gatsby's wanting too much, his forcing her to take one side when she fundamentally cannot rid herself of Tom and all the social benefits and material comforts he provides. Love to Daisy has nothing to do with why she stays with Tom, which is why she ultimately stays despite her husband's bare-faced philandering and abuse. A great moment which crystallizes Gatsby's tragic misunderstanding about love and marriage comes at the end of the same chapter, when Fitzgerald juxtaposes an intimate vignette of Tom and Daisy as husband and wife against the lonely delusional figure of Gatsby watching over the Buchanan's house from outside. Tom and Daisy were sitting opposite each other at the kitchen table with a plate of cold fried chicken between them and two bottles of ale. He was talking intently across the table at her and in his earnestness, his hand had fallen upon and covered her own. Once in a while, she looked at him and nodded in agreement. They weren't happy and neither of them had touched the chicken or the ale. And yet they weren't unhappy either. There was an unmistakable air of natural intimacy about the picture and anybody would have said that they were conspiring together. And meanwhile, Gatsby, standing outside the Buchanan's home, tells Nick that he wants to wait here till Daisy goes to bed. Still steeped in his delusional fantasy of Daisy one day leaving her husband for him. Exasperated over his hopeless romantic of a friend, Nick reflects. Gatsby put his hand in his coat pocket and turned back eagerly to his scrutiny of the Buchanan's house, as though my presence marred the sacredness of the vigil. So I walked away and left him standing there in the moonlight, watching over nothing. Now this is probably my favourite scene in the book because it's so poignant, tragic and poetic all at once. It's also dramatically ironic because Gatsby is completely oblivious to the fact that Daisy and Tom have already started mending their relationship while he continues to pine after the possibility of Daisy leaving Tom. For all their fights and bitterness over Tom's infidelities and Daisy's whimsicality, the Buchanans are inseparable. The imagery of the untouched plate of cold fried chicken and two bottles of ale symbolizes the staleness of their marriage and the mutual need for intoxication in order for either husband and wife to stand each other. But be that as it may, they share this unmistakable air of intimacy because they are, unlike Gatsby, people who prize the material over the emotional, who want the comfort of a familiar tribe over the daunting prospect of self-discovery and people who would sacrifice personal authenticity for social validation in a heartbeat. Indeed, we see them conspiring together as they carry forth the mantle of a staid, complacent existence, cushioned by inherited prestige. All the while, the naive upstarts like Gatsby pitifully watches over nothing without even realizing it. And there you have it, guys. Two main reasons why I think Gatsby is such a tragic figure. First, because he doesn't even know what he truly wants. And second, because he suffers a deep misunderstanding about love and marriage. So I'm sure there are many other reasons for Gatsby's tragedy. So if you guys have any other ideas, please do share them in the comments section below. Otherwise, please do hit the thumbs up button if you found this video helpful for your studies and subscribe to my channel and switch on the bell notification so you never miss a top grade English Lit Study video from me. And I'll see you guys very soon. Bye.